Okay. Okay, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, those who are here uh, in the room and those who are connected uh, from home. Uh, I'm Francesca Frontini. I am a researcher at the Institute for Computational Linguistics uh, of CNR in Pisa, and also uh, I'm part of the Board of Directors uh, of Clarineric. Uh, I am today uh, stepping in for Monica Monachini, who could not be here, unfortunately, and was uh, supposed to be the chair of this session. So I will be the chair of the session as well as one of the presenters. Uh, two of the presenters are here in uh, presence and uh, then there is one, uh, Daniela, who should be connected uh, uh, online. So this, uh, this session, as, uh, as you can see, is uh, going to give you us an insight about what um, research enablers have been developed in uh, shock uh, for what concerns multilingualism. So I'm going to say a few words to set uh, the scene. Uh, then uh, I myself will start with the first uh, uh, short presentation about uh, the work we've done, and uh, we, I will be followed by the other three presenters. Uh, then we will just uh, break the ice with the audience uh, and collect uh, questions uh, from them. And uh, we also have a set of uh, predefined uh, questions that we would like to ask our panel. And then the discussion will, uh, will go on, uh, hopefully in a uh, dynamic way. And then uh, at the end, uh, we will wrap up and let you go. So um, multilinguality has been a crucial uh, transversal topic throughout uh, the shock project uh, work packages and activities. Indeed, uh, this is why is, is this so? It is uh, by, because SSH researchers, uh, in fact, uh, uh, notoriously produce access archive culturally and socially relevant work in multiple languages and not just uh, uh, in English. And we've heard uh, already this morning uh, this fact being mentioned and that how this is also an, an issue for discovery services, for instance. And, then, and, in, and in fact, uh, uh, we see that uh, multilingual data in uh, SSH can come in different forms and from different communities. Um, today we will hear about uh, metadata, multilingual metadata and terminologies which uh, uh, of course uh, uh, are crucial to uh, facilitate uh, um, discover discoverability of content but also about surveys which are used to collect information uh, across countries, across political systems, etc., and uh, um, legal texts that uh, need to be compared uh, across different legal systems. So um, it is true that to, in order to achieve quality multilingual data, uh, human intervention and human uh, curation is still uh, very, very important. We uh, wanted to see in, in shock and especially in uh, work package three and uh, in uh, task 3.1, uh, how uh, language technologies that, and that's, that are now state of the art uh, can help uh, speed up the process at, uh, but also uh, ensure uh, the quality of, of uh, the process of creation of these multilingual resources. So this is the panel for today. Uh, apart from myself, uh, we will have uh, a presentation by Daniela Cecon uh, from Wage Indicator. Uh, Indicator. I will uh, be briefly introduce the speakers um, as, uh, they pre before they present. Yuri Pektiniki from uh, Max Planck uh, Institute uh, from CHER, who is here in person, and uh, Ami Saji from uh, Sciences Po, also here. Um, Okay, this is the titles. Uh, these are the titles of the presentation. So you see terminologies uh, uh, from me. Uh, sorry, there's a problem with uh, the alignment, but I guess you can still read. Prototype uh, for uh, uh, text and data mi mi uh, mining and statistical analysis on legal texts by Daniela Cecon, online presentation. Uh, automatic verification uh, tools for translations by Yuri and discovering and learning from multilingual questionnaires including in, included in the ethnic and migrant minority question data bank by Amy Saj. So now uh, as a presenter, 
Um, so this uh, work that I introduce here is, was carried out, uh, uh, was coordinated uh, by Monica Monachini at uh, ILC CNR and uh, involved myself and other researchers throughout the shock consortium and aimed at uh, uh, kind of uh, testing uh, machine translation tools uh, for the creation of multilingual terminologies. So, as uh, I've uh, just reiterated, uh, of course, uh, uh, vocabularies are an essential uh, tool for classification and discovery, also in the SSH. And uh, uh, in shock, they uh, are and then can become an essential tool for the SSH open marketplace, also to achieve uh, a better interoperability between the various discovery uh, platforms that we've uh, learned uh, to, to know better this morning. But as I said, uh, researchers, of course, produce uh, cultural content and, and scientific content in uh, various languages, in local languages. They also use uh, different uh, materials in different languages. And, uh, um, but at the same time, what we noticed is that deposit and search facilities, uh, both for data and uh, uh, for publications are still mostly available on only via the English medium. So um, how do we translate uh, metadata, keywords, terminologies, uh, and also, crucially, their definitions uh, in uh, uh, various languages so that we can enable multilingual uh, search and facilitate access? So mm, the objective of uh, the task was uh, twofold. First of all, we wanted to test the state of the art uh, uh, tools for terminology extraction, and sorry, machine translation, there's a, there's a typo, uh, to speed up and optimize the creation of multilingual vocabularies. And then we wanted to be able to produce and publish uh, resources uh, out of this uh, exercise that uh, could be then make, made available uh, via the Clarin and shock channels. So we uh, implemented two case studies. Uh, first of all, uh, a case study was, uh, the first case study was the translation of the Clarin core uh, metadata. Um, so this work in particular was also uh, suggested by Dan Broder, who isn't here because he's in the other session. So Clarin, Eric has a Clarin concept registry where various vocabularies are stored, and there is a core set of uh, 232 uh, core metadata that are used uh, also to annotate uh, language resources. And we uh, decided to um, translate them in Dutch, French, Greek and Italian using various machine translation services uh, that were uh, available, made available, both by Charles University, which is one of the was one of the partners in the project, and also commercial uh, engines such as Google Translate, DeepL, and Reverso. So this uh, first exercise, uh, um, first of all, allowed us to uh, get the core, core, core uh, metadata translated, but also to allow us to identify which was uh, the machine uh, translation systems, uh, which were the machine translation systems working best uh, for the various languages. Um, then we uh, stepped into the second use case, which was uh, the creation and translation of um, a terminology uh, for the domain of data stewardship, data curation. And in that case, we uh, basically were able to extract 210 domain-specific concepts that were then translated in uh, uh, various other languages, Dutch, French, German, Greek, Italian, and Slovenian. But in this case, we uh, continued with the mach machine translation services that we knew were working best. So the two workflows are, oops, how do I go back? Uh, uh, I did something wrong here. Is there a way to help me here, maybe? Okay, <laughs> sorry. One, uh, one more? Yeah, n not uh, again? Okay, perfect, thanks. Uh, I must have touched something that triggered the 
the presentation, automatic presentation. So these are the two workflows. Uh, so on the first, uh, on the, on, for the first one, we started from the metadata. We tested various machine translation technologies, and then crucially, we uh, uh, submitted the results uh, to manual validation. Uh, actually, we had uh, two experts uh, uh, for each. Uh, um, uh, for the data to validate the data set for, for uh, the various languages. And uh, then we um, identified, uh, sorry, it's still moving by its own will. I would like to go back to this uh, previous slide. Yeah. One, two more, okay. Uh, okay, so this is, for instance, this is the table that we used for validation in the various languages. So we, we checked uh, each uh, uh, machine translation tool uh, for each language. The results uh, were submitted to experts and they validated both the translation of the term and the translation of the, uh, of the definition. So once we've uh, done that, we had our multilingual metadata ready. We went to the second uh, workflow. <coughs> where we actually applied state-of-the-art uh, terminology extraction uh, tools, which uh, uh, then restituted a list of uh, terms, uh, candidate terms for the domain. We used a corpus in that, in that case and extracted automatically the terms and then applied machine translation afterwards. So the terminology extraction phase was monolingual, but then machine translation helped to make it multilingual. In both cases, uh, and now I can actually um, go to the next slide. In both cases, so manual validation was necessary to assess both the translation and the, ter the terms that were extracted. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, technologies were uh, very in beneficial in speeding up uh, the project. The results are uh, now available uh, as uh, uh, f formally uh, encoded uh, SCOS terminologies that uh, can be downloaded from the ilk for claren repository and are also, uh, uh, can also be uh, consulted online as part of the uh, SSH Vocabulary Commons platform. Okay, so this is how uh, it uh, looks like online. So you see you have a term, a definition, a translation of the terms uh, in various other languages. And what we've done also was to add links to other existing resources. Some of these resources are also uh, multilingual resources. So the fact that we had a, a multilingual resource to begin with also facilitated the linking uh, process. So uh, what's the added value for the users? Of course, uh, uh, as I said, having a publication, uh, having, having the resources published in SCOS and openly available, facilitate creating links to other terminologies that are out there. And uh, especially for the data stewardship terminology, there is a lot of uh, work carried out uh, around uh, defining what data stewardship is, what are the tasks or the skills that data stewards have to fulfill. So uh, these type of terminologies are very useful and we created in fact links to the Lutero Open Science Thesaurus and the terms for fair skills uh, terminology. And in fact, uh, we uh, also plan to reuse these terminologies in other contexts, uh, such as uh, the data stewardship uh, uh, EOSC task force, uh, indeed to help them define roles and skills for uh, data stewards. So that's all uh, from me, and uh, I am now handing it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am now handing over to, uh, to Daniela, uh, who is, I guess, uh, connected online. So I'm, I'm here to introduce Not her yet. first. Okay. Yeah. So Daniela, uh, who is joining online, is a journalist and director of data at Wage Indicator Foundation, as well as a researcher. Uh, she worked in, within the context of shock. She worked uh, with Clarin for Clarin. Uh, and contributed to several publications uh, related to uh, collective agreements uh, data, uh, generally related labor issues and living, living wages. And <coughs> this is what she's going to tell us about. Hi. The floor is yours, Daniela. 
Hello, everyone. I don't know. Okay, yeah. I have a bit of return of the sound. Okay, so um, as thank you, Francisca, for the presentation. Um, and the greetings on behalf also of the uh, of the Wage Indicator team and of the developers who helped me uh, work on this tool. So yes, as Francesco was saying, this is a prototype for text and data mining and statistical analysis on legal texts. In particular, um, it it uh, it relates to collective agreements, so which are a particular type of uh, legal documents. So, um, collective agreements are documents containing conditions of employment uh, and they result from the negotiations between independent unions and employers. So, these are really important legal documents which can uh, help in protecting and improving workers' rights. Uh, however, uh, so one of the challenges here uh, with working with collective agreements is that they are often surrounded by an atmosphere of secrecy, so sometimes uh, it, they are really difficult to obtain, so it's difficult to get hold of the text. Uh, sometimes they are copyrighted, and uh, of course they are written in the national language of the country. Uh, since 2012, the Wage Indicator Foundation has been collecting and annotating collective agreements uh, on a global scale in the Wage Indicator Collective Agreements database. And now, also, uh, thanks to the SHOP project, uh, we have around 1,600 agreements from 61 countries and written in uh, 27 different languages. Um, so how does it work in the wage indicator um, system? So once we have the collective agreement text, we upload it in um, our annotation system. And then we answer to a series of questions uh, related to labor provisions. We are talking about really a lot of questions, so around 700 variables. And uh, when we answer, we also manually select um, the paragraph in which the answer can be found. So this is an example of how it looks. Um, so we have, for example, the question about the trial period, and you see in yellow in this uh, Italian agreement the piece of text where the answer can be found. Um, the result of this um, of this work is a data set uh, which contains, um, of course, the, the question ID, uh, the question label, and the close. So it's the closest um, data set. Um, which problem did we want to solve uh, with this tool? So, of course, the number of collective agreements uh, in different languages is growing because I would say every day new collective agreements are signed. So, uh, the challenge to annotate, understand and analyze them also um, becomes bigger. So, we thought um, whether text and data mining uh, tools could help um, us in this. So what we did was we uh, took this closest data set and we applied to it three different models. Um, we compared them and then for each language and each question, uh, we identified which model works better in spotting the right piece of text. Uh, so the models we use are the relative frequency model, which includes, of course, includes of course training and testing, and two variants of the Google Universal Centers Encoder model. Okay, and um, using this information, we created an interactive tool. So this tool is basically a Google collaboratory notebook, um, and um, users can upload new collective agreements in different formats. So it works with HTML, TXT, or Word documents, and they can select one of the languages in the list. So you see, this is where you um, upload the agreement, and this is where you select uh, the language. Okay, then the system applies the predetermined model, so uh, that is defined per language as question and question, as I just explained. And the model identifies the portion of text where the answer can be found. And the result is basically the list of questions, the questions IDs, and the relevant paragraphs. So see, for example, here, you have the question, um, how many weeks of paid annual leave are agreed? Um, the uh, question ID is holidays weeks, and then this is the piece of text from a Spanish collective agreement, uh, which contains uh, basically the answer uh, to this question. Or in other words, 
it, it contains that topic. Um, the tool also has an extra feature um, for which we need to thank the Helsinki Digital Humanities Hackathon 2021, where we participated as, as shock. Um, and our team had um, the same data. We don't have agreements, but again, it doesn't matter because um, they are not needed for the training. Yes, thank you for your attention. Um, that's all. I just would like to um, provide the marketplace link because that's where the tool can be actually tried. So it's available. Uh, and also the data sets that we used can be um, downloaded from, from the marketplace. So that's um, our code there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela, and please stay with us for the panel afterwards. I will now introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, Yuri Petiniki, who is a survey specialist uh, at SHARE, working at the Munich Center for Economic uh, of Aging. Uh, from the Max Planck uh, Institute, and he uh, coordinated the translation procedures, uh, managing uh, 20 country teams and uh, 40 uh, various, various languages, and he's going to tell us now how this can be done uh, in, a, in, a, in an efficient way. Uh, Yuri, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, good evening uh, to everybody. Um, today, during this talk, we talk about this, uh, this tool that we developed during the, the shock business. Um, oh, yo, now I get your point. Uh, how to move forward? Okay. So, um, um, during the, the translation procedure of a survey, so we need to cover uh, uh, several uh, languages. That's the goal of the survey in a multi country setting. We, we want to capture the same concept. Uh, in a national uh, context or institution, but also in national, uh, in different languages. So we need to harmonize uh, the, the, the tool that we use uh, to capture this concept. Uh, and uh, one way to, one difficult, one challenge in the between uh, the harmonization that we have in mind is that language, of course. The different languages can, uh, can provide some, um, some challenges there. 
uh, that's nothing new. So translation teams, they were working on that since ages. And uh, what we are, uh, what I have in mind with this tool is uh, a special situation when uh, you are under pressure to, del to deliver the translation for time, uh, for time reason, for example, and you have a, a huge amount of work to process, uh, so you have to be also quick, and, uh, uh, and uh, the complexity is, not, uh, is also an, another layer uh, that uh, can, uh, you have to face. For example, if you have to translate some plain text, it's uh, one sentence uh, in the other one, but when you have to introduce uh, in this, the plain text some uh, uh, syntax uh, for, for, from, uh, from the programmer, the complexity has become bigger and bigger, and uh, so the translation teams they need to, to spend more time to, to perform their task. So therefore, uh, our, uh, the beginning of the, of the, of the, of the shock project, uh, we had in mind to develop a tool that uh, help the translation teams uh, with the, the new technology that they are being developed in recently, so the machine translations uh, tools, uh, to empower and, and enrich their environment. So, um, of course, uh, we don't want to substitute with uh, this machine translation uh, the role of the humans in, uh, in the process. Uh, that's not our goal, definitely, because we want to keep the humans uh, working on what they do best. And we want to also let the algorithm take care of the simple and repetitive task, uh, so to free the, 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 the power and, and, the, and the time of the, of the human translators. So, summing up, uh, the, the, with this, uh, in this project, we want just to add an extra tool, one extra tool, to the toolbox of the translation teams. So we don't want to replace them, we just, just give an extra tool. So how this extra tool works? So and, uh, the, we have a, a source text that can be also made by you know, English uh, version with some programming language into that. Then we ask the translator to, the, to, to translate and provide a target text, so very simple. But then we feed these two texts into uh, this machine and the machine will provide us just a flag, a green and a red flag. And if it's red, we ask, just ask the, the, um, the translator to recheck what they did. So the, 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 current, uh, the uh, current stage, the, the flag is uh, uninformative. So the, we, we don't know what's the issue there. So we don't point it out about the issue. We just uh, mention that uh, the, 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 the text should be rechecked. So what's the value added uh, for, this, uh, for the users using this tool? So, uh, of course, uh, when uh, you have to, to check uh, a, a very short text, like a response option in service, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, the tool works very well, uh, but also able to handle text with programming syntax. Uh, so when you want to have dynamic text display on the screen and the, the, f the, f the routing of the text is based on the gender uh, of the respondent, for example, then you have to display different text based on the gender, then uh, you want to keep this, the syntax uh, for the programmers within the text. You don't, you don't want to replace the text. And so this tool is able to handle while uh, other, uh, other, other, other tools that we, we, we tested were not able to handle the, the programming syntax uh, in the plain text. Also, we want to allow the, so the tools allow the translation team to speed up the early stage of the procedure. So at the beginning, when they, they start to, to, to have the first round of translation, and uh, they want to check very quickly if anything, uh, so the quality of uh, the initial quality of the first translation, they can feed the, the, the text to the tool and already get an idea if the, the quality is good enough or not at the early stage of the, of the, of the, um, of the procedure. Why I'm saying so? Because uh, to capture the most difficult issues, the most uh, the, the, the subtle uh, uh, um, differences between uh, one word and the other in that given language, uh, you need more experience, more know-how, and that only the human uh, translator and the teams can do uh, at, uh, at this point in time. We don't know about in 20 years, we don't know about in 30 years, but for now, uh, we, need to, we can uh, use these tools very, very fruitful at the early stage of the procedure. But of course, there are not only the translation teams, uh, they're not only people that translate from English to another language, but there are also the people uh, like me that uh, supervise the, the, the procedure. And uh, there are other uh, uh, projects in Europe that need to uh, field a survey in multiple countries. So there are other me in Europe that they can make use of, this, uh, of, the, of these tools. Uh, and uh, we call it the translation procedure managers. And um, they, can, uh, they, they are blind most of the time to the other languages because they just speak a few of them. And so when they need to f check uh, the work done by the translator, they can also use this tool to see if uh, the tool provides a high rate of uh, flag uh, uh, items or not. So uh, at, the point in, at the, this point in time, uh, we have a, a, um, the tool is based on the bilingual lexical induction. 
so comparing the two texts uh, using a, a train word embeddings at the current point in time. So the, this was uh, been drawn for, for shock. And, the, and here I want just to quickly uh, adjust the future. So we plan to train also the same model uh, that are able to, to give us the, the, the flag uh, using uh, phrase embeddings. So not only word by word, but the comparison the, of sentences. And, uh, and, uh, and another uh, direction we want to, to address is, uh, of course, the, when, you, when you were um, with machine translation uh, and the ma machine learning, uh, so the, 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 the current uh, uh, most uh, um, relevant uh, aspect of the, of the process uh, is the initial data set uh, you have used to train your model. And so uh, what we, are, we were doing uh, for this project, we're using uh, uh, the standard data set we have in the literature, uh, the proceedings from uh, the U European Union uh, in, uh, in 26 languages. But of course, uh, uh, this, that corpus was uh, built in, uh, let's say, five years ago, and so there were some words that were not there at all. So COVID, there's a new word that will end up in our uh, current language. So uh, our idea was to use, uh, uh, to reach, to improve the training data, the data we use for training, uh, adding the unmatched word, for example, corona and, and uh, corona coronavirus or COVID uh, and, and others. So improving this one will also improve the, um, the, 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 the performance of the, of the tool itself. So that's from my side. I and thanks uh, to Yuri for this uh, interesting presentation and uh, to our last speaker for today before we start with our panel discussion. Uh, Ami, uh, Ami Saji is a junior researcher at uh, Sciences Po uh, in Paris. And uh, within uh, the shock project, uh, she worked on the verification of data uh, on ethnic and uh, uh, migrant minorities. And uh, uh, she uh, helped creating a free service uh, um, like the ethnic, uh, that is the, the ethnic and mi migrant minority survey registry. So she will tell us about uh, this, her presentation. Thank you very much. So as Francesca mentioned, I am part of the Ethnic and Migration Studies data community of Shock. And for those of you who might not be familiar with who we are, we are essentially um, data producers, uh, data users, data curators, data managers who work specifically with quantitative surveys undertaken with ethnic and migrant minorities. And we have a shared interest in making our type of data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And within the context of Shock, what we've been trying to do is either develop fully um, a service um, that, it, that makes this data fair, um, or at least try to test the feasibility of, of um, certain services to be developed. So the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank, which is what I'm going to be presenting about today, is one of these services. Um, and it's one of the ones where we're just trying to figure out if such a tool can be developed. Um, and we felt that this would be a really appropriate choice for the focus of this session, because we actually handle and tackle the, the question of multilingualism. So starting with the very kind of basic question, what exactly is the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank? Um, it is, as I mentioned, a service that is currently in development. Um, it's really, really close to being launched, at least in an official version. Um, this service is intended to be free. So once you get to the landing page of the service, you can fully use uh, the service without any kind of barriers to entry. Um, we have also made a strategic choice to actually house this service as part of an existing um, infrastructure, which is the Collectica por portal of Sciencebo's uh, CDSB. Um, and this allows us to kind of dedicate more on kind of figuring out the really nitty gritty details of how we work with the types of um, questionnaires that are relevant to us. And then we can allow kind of the technological decisions to be handled by experts um, in, in that kind of uh, field. So the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank will specifically cover questionnaires from quantitative surveys undertaken with ethnic and migrant minorities, and more specifically, those that have already be, been documented in another service that we've created, um, which is called the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry. For those of you who are not familiar with that service, um, it is um, 
a free online tool where you can essentially go and discover um, various quantitative surveys that have been undertaken with this specific target population. And to date, we have over 1,700 surveys uh, captured um, in 30 different countries. So it's really intended to be more like a live census of the surveys of, of, in of interest to us as a data community. Um, moreover, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank is going to allow users to explore and view not only the full questionnaires that have been used in these types of surveys, but also each of the specific, specific items. So that could be actual questions that have been posed, the code lists that have been used, um, specific instructions or statements that have been included in, in the questionnaire. So it's really intended to allow kind of um, different ways to really engage with the questionnaires itself, which is not always feasible when you actually look at the original questionnaires, which are often preserved in kind of a PDF, maybe sometimes in a Word or um, Excel format. Um, and then finally, um, one kind of really specific feature that we wanted to include in the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank is to actually allow users to explore and view relationships across the different questionnaires that we're capturing, as well as the different questions. And most notably, we're going to be doing this by focusing on the different language versions and conceptual linkages. And by conceptual linkages, we're talking about specific concepts of ethnic and migrant minorities uh, integration or inclusion that have been um, captured by these d different questionnaires. So what kind of multilingual questionnaires are actually covered by the ethnic and migrant minority question data bank? Um, so actually a, a significant number of the questionnaires that we end up dealing with are multilingual and there are two kind of reasons why but not uh, mutually exclusive reasons. So one reason is that a survey was conducted in different countries, so this could be like a cross-country or international survey program like ESS, uh, the European Social Survey, um, and the questionnaire was essentially offered in the different languages spoken in these countries, so French for France, Spanish for Spain, for, for example. It's also the case, uh, because we're working with ethnic uh, minorities and or migrant minorities, there's a value added to actually translate questionnaires into the languages spoken by these specific populations. So for that reason, even within a single location, say France, you might have a questionnaire that was fielded in Arabic, um, in French, um, in Spanish, to kind of cover the, the core languages spoken by your target respondents. So keeping in mind kind of the types of multilingual questionnaires that we're seeing, we had to think about kind of what the actual different language, language versions mean in relation to one another. So there are, again, kind of two, two ways to think about the different language versions of a given questionnaire. We have one instance where they're actually, it can, can be considered to be equivalent translations of one another. What we mean by that is, really the only difference between the, the different versions is the language excel, itself. So they're really, um, if you would map them out together, you would see line by line, they match up perfectly, just the language being used is different. Then there's also this other situation where sometimes the language uh, variations will differ because they've been adapted to address very specific needs of the respondent groups for the various uh, target languages. So to give you an example, we are currently working with a survey called Local Multidem, and one of the questions they include in this uh, survey is um, familiarity with a specific type of ethnic association. And actually, the specific ethnic association that is inserted into the, the question varies depending on who the respondent is. So if you are um, a Roma respondent, then they're going to ask you if you know a Roma um, association. But if you are um, a Muslim respondent, maybe they would insert um, an association uh, that is prominent in the Muslim community. Um, so then what happens, because we have these kind of different ways in which these language versions are extinct for a questionnaire, we've actually had to think about how to handle them, but still use the same interface to, to display them. So the more simple version is the, the question for questionnaires where the language versions are equivalent translations. What we've been able to do is by using um, very specific software, so because we're using Collectica Portal as the interface to view the questionnaires, we're using other Collectica products to actually manually input the uh, questionnaires uh, for display. And how we do it, I won't go into detail the, the nitty gritty about how that works, but essentially we are inputting it in a way so that eventually when you add it to the actual interface that users would come to, um, when you actually drill into each and every item um, that's included in the questionnaire, you can see the different language versions. Um, I'm really sorry, the image is probably really, really small, but um, here, 
here is essentially where you would see all the different language translations that exist for a specific question item. Now, it's a little bit trickier when the language versions are not exact translations um, because you can't really say that what's been presented in French exact, is exactly what is represented in English. So for that purpose, we actually, instead of documenting the different language versions as one single kind of questionnaire, um, we're actually treating each language version as its own independent uh, questionnaire. And then we use a very specific feature within uh, Collectica um, where we're able to group and identify that they belong to the same kind of um, collection. Um, and then when you actually go and look at the, um, the survey kind of level information that you can find on the interface, you can see all the different language versions that exist. Um, so this is not particularly the best example because this is actually a questionnaire that was fielded in Milan, this one's in Lyon, but it would function in the same way if in Lyon, they had the French version plus, um, I don't know, Eric's version, it would display right here and you would at least see that, oh, okay, in, in Lyon, we actually had two different language versions and this also means that there were some slight variations between those language versions, which is why we don't see it all, all together in a single, um, what we call instrument or questionnaire. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to highlight is actually um, the link between the types of conceptual information that we're tr attempting to, to capture and make available for the questionnaires, and then particularly in terms of how um, that interacts with multilingual questionnaires. So um, I'll start by kind of explaining how we're actually capturing conceptual information. The idea is for every single question um, about ethnic and migrant minorities integration and our inclusion, they're going to be mapped or tagged to very specific concepts. And these, I should also mention that the concepts that we've developed, they are um, like very detailed conceptual hierarchies that have been developed by experts of a specific dimension of ethnic and migrant minorities integration or inclusion. So they are kind of the vocabulary, the, the type of classifications that you would find from researchers who are really well versed in the specific uh, dimension. Um, and so with the concepts, what we do is we are, there is a functionality that allows us to, to tag specific questions that map onto the specific concepts. And then as a user, you would be able to view this conceptual tagging that we've done in two different ways. One, when you're actually viewing the whole questionnaire in whole, we actually have labeled questions that map onto specific concepts. So it's this box here. Um, and there's kind of a hint as to what the, the, the concept is. So the first one is, it's a question about objective political knowledge in the country of residence. The next one is about turnout intention in national parliamentary elections in the country of residence. So you can have a very quick sense of which types of concepts are actually covered in, in the uh, questionnaire. We also wanted to make sure that if someone were to drill into a specific question item, which is a, a common kind of anticipated use case because if you want to use a question, you might want to see other things like were there other instructions included or what were the code lists used if it was a multiple choice question. Um, so for that reason, we've also created a way to show conceptual information um, when actually drilling into the specific question. So it's that box at the bottom labeled concept. And there you can also see again the specific concept that it's been mapped onto um, so that you have a sense of, of what the question is about when even when you depart from the overall view of the questionnaire. Um, and then, so what that means for kind of multilingual questionnaires, again, because we're documenting these multilingual uh, questionnaires uh, differently, depending on how the language variations um, relate to one another, in cases where the language versions are in fact um, equivalent translations and they are captured all together through a single questionnaire, or yeah, single questionnaire instrument, you again, by going into the question view, you would see all of the translations for a given uh, question, and then below, at the bottom, you would see all the concepts. So basically, you would see, okay, these are all the, quest uh, the questions um, in the different languages that map onto this specific concept. Now, for quest multilingual questionnaires, where each language version is treated as its own kind of questionnaire, then um, we have figured out a way where if you actually go instead first to view the conceptual information, then you can see a tree on the right hand side that kind of shows you um, in which other questionnaires um, the same concept has been addressed. Um, 
And you can also play, a lot, play around with the tree to actually s to see the actual questions so you can really be sure that they are the different language versions um, for a given questionnaire. So that is, in essence, kind of um, how we are addressing the issue of multilingualism when it relates to the ethnic and migrant minority question data bank. Um, if you are interested in kind of the type of work that you're doing, these are all the various ways that we, you can connect with us. Perhaps it's not very helpful if you don't actually see the links for some of these, but if you're interested in the slides, I can also share those with you, and if you click on them, you would be directed to the appropriate links. Um, and like I said, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority uh, Question Data Bank is really close to being launched, so um, if you really want to see what it would look like, because um, right now it's in a testing environment, please connect with us and we, you'll be alerted as to when it goes live and then you'll be able to kind of see yourself how the actual service works. Uh, in fact, you, you can both uh, join me on stage and uh, also I think Daniela can uh, Reconnect. Uh, um, so uh, we have ample time for discussing. And uh, first, and first of all, I would like to uh, hand the metaphorical mic microphone over to the audience. Um, please feel free to let us know why you're here, what uh, is your interest in the session, and also maybe uh, come up with. Uh, uh, your questions. Uh, we, we have a list of questions also that have been uh, identified to discuss with our uh, panelists, but uh, we would like to hear yours uh, uh, first. Hi. Uh, my name is Julia. I work as a junior researcher at EVS, European Value Study. And we are doing something very similar uh, to the last panelist, the last presenter. And uh, my question is, we have like very old questionnaires, like from waves in uh, 1981, 1990, that we are trying to uh, preserve. And we are using similar tool uh, to do that, to do the input, to get the questionnaires in all the language, to put it there. But first, we use OCR to get the text from the image, but sometimes it's just like too bad the image that the, the tool cannot recover the text. So we are not very sure if we are doing because we do not speak all those languages, so we are not very sure if the translations are very accurate. So I would ask, like, do you have any advice for that? Like, do you use any human expertise afterwards to check if, okay, do they, um, are they accurate or are they not? Because, yeah, that's the point they should be. Thanks. That's a really, really important question. It's something that we also tackle even when dealing with recent questionnaires because it's also the case that um, questionnaires might be locked in a specific PDF format and you can try to extract it in various ways but it doesn't always work perfectly. So unfortunately, we've had to kind of really think about the workflows that we're doing to account for a lot of human resources um, because we actually need a human in many cases to manually extract the text, to make sure that it makes sense um, and then input it into uh, the software that we're using. Um, but if we're in a similar case, but if you're interested in kind of partnering up and trying to see what the available kind of solutions are, we'd be very happy because right now it's really not sustainable to kind of allocate that kind of human resources because in order to create a service that really is comprehensive and meaningful, um, it would take a lot of time to actually input the questionnaires if we require so much human demand to even just do a simple task like extracting the text. If I may intervene, yeah, I wanted to say that we have sort of the same problem with the collective agreements because um, we also yeah. often get them in, a, a, I don't know, scanned, uh, almost handwritten texts. So we also use an OCR uh, software for that. But then, yes, we need to allocate really human resources on that, on checking that the OCR uh, picked the right, um, the right text. So that's, that's quite a challenge for us as well. Uh, just a follow-up. Uh, do you use native speakers to check that out, or do you use like a, yeah, just a human with Google Translator or? Uh, 
<laughs> no, we don't use Google Translate. We try to find ideally native speakers or at least someone who has a C1 proficiency. Okay. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, any more questions? Uh, otherwise, in uh, the meantime, we can uh, uh, address some of the questions that we, uh, we have here on our list. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, maybe we can ask ourselves which, are, uh, which were the main uh, language-related challenges that, uh, that were faced uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, in the projects, uh, maybe da Daniela wants to uh, say something about it. Um, yes, well, let's say that the the tool itself was created because languages were really a challenge in the case of of collective agreements. Um, of course, well, as we we're just talking about that now, we can't have annotators that are native speakers speakers of all the 27 languages, because they also need to have some experience in law, for example. Um, so, yeah, that, that, is, that is the main, um, the main challenge we had. Then, uh, as I explained, in the tool itself, um, the problem is mainly for the training of one of the models, because, um, yeah, you need more, um, more texts in the in the original language to train uh, the tool. Otherwise, it doesn't work for some of the languages, uh, or at least for some of the topics. Um, yeah, and and another another challenge I'm thinking about is that also um, I think the tool works better for those topics where the vocabulary in that language is very specific uh, for that topic. So, for example, a topic like maternity leave is easier to spot because you know when it's about mothers working mothers nursing mothers uh, maternity this is all like in all languages it means usually that that is the the paragraph where maternity leave is addressed but there are other many more general words um which appear in all the topics. So that confuses um the tool uh, a bit I guess so that's yeah, that's a bit of a challenge. Okay. Um, maybe some of the other panelists, uh, Yuri, maybe you want to add something? To the first question, mm -hmm. yeah. So here, um, what I have in mind is uh, when you have to, to work with a model, train on a given language, mm. you try to use the same model to a similar language, mm. let's say German in Germany, and German in uh, Austria, uh, Switzerland, and Luxembourg, for example. You want to try to do the same motive to get the same performance and sometimes it's acceptable, sometimes uh, the language that is speaking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a given, uh, in a given uh, country is not uh, mm. Germany for the case, uh, they can um, provide some challenges there. So you have to adjust and pick up this, uh, this matching and, uh, and retrain the model for that. That would be one of those. Uh, so then in the, in, the, in, the, in the field, we call it uh, language specific, you know, country specific mm. languages or uh, lang uh, language uh, version, uh, so version of versions of languages, so they would say to be more specific. Yeah, yeah indeed. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, aspect which uh, deals with the fact that uh, uh, language here is used to convey very specific concepts, of course, uh, that can be not just language specific, but um, uh, culture or country specific, especially for the legal terms, the administrative uh, uh, terms, but also in our case, uh, I, I we haven't uh, checked this, but uh, thoroughly. But uh, uh, for languages such as French or German, indeed, even uh, metadata descriptors uh, uh, could have differences across countries. So this is a definitely a problem uh, that uh, is common. I would say to the topics that we presented uh, in this session, in that it's not. Uh, uh, everyday language, but it's a very specialized language which can also uh, vary across uh, across country. I don't know, Emmy, if we want to add something on this uh, question. Um, I think the, the main challenge for us actually relates to the question that was posed for us, um, just the number of languages that we would need to cover mm. if we wanted to develop a full-scale service is around 200 and 250, and right now we're a team of 
four. So it's uh, not realistic to think that we can cover all of those languages ourselves, even if we were magicians and we were super multilingual, um, it's still, still a lot of work. Um, so unfortunately, I guess, even though we have a clear process for how you can handle multilingual questionnaires and input them in a way to display in a user-friendly manner, um, there's still this big question of scalability, what's actually feasible, what's actually realistic, but also making sure that the end service is useful. Um, if it can only cover 10 questionnaires, probably no one's going to really be consulting the, the service. Uh, questions also from the chat or no? Then we can. Uh, let me just keep going on yeah, the, on this please. point because uh, I also can touch on another question mm -hmm, we have. Sure. And, uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, true. So uh, my so our recommendation, my recommendation for other researchers that uh, would like to work on these uh, new tools, like uh, similar multilingual tools, is. Uh, Maybe to start small, mm -hmm. okay, like uh, not, tr so if the task that you face is like uh, comparing 200 languages, it's very daunting and very challenging, but just start small, try to have uh, maybe with few languages, two, three cases uh, for, uh, for, uh, for your tool, make a proof of concept, so to see that, okay, now I, I address it, I know which are the challenges, what we need to do better, uh, I know the, all the aspects, and then scale up. That should be the, the approach. If you start immediately to try to have one tool that uh, is able to manage everything, then uh, you, you fail immediately because it's too much, and then a uh, team of four, team of ten, uh, probably doesn't matter at the end it's, when it's too much, it's too much. And that would be my recommendation. So start small and then scale up later when uh, it works, uh, at least for the, for, the, for the small case. That's a very interesting and useful uh, suggestion. Indeed, if you think of covering all the languages all at once, probably you will never have the resources uh, for that. And also the fact of being able to publish your results uh, uh, may help you find uh, uh, support from other <laughs> parties that want maybe to join to add the support for their languages. Uh, so in that or, or extra fundings for uh, yeah exactly <laughs> I didn't want to say it but yeah <laughs> indeed uh, why not <laughs> and uh, indeed this is maybe also to go to move towards the second question uh, I guess once you have uh, um, a viable uh, prototype you uh, want to dis be able to disseminate uh, what you have done and uh, to especially to your target communities so maybe. Um, uh, you can say a few words about uh, about this. Uh, um, sure. So our okay. our service is not live yet, but luckily we because we've launched the other service, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry, we kind of have a blueprint and established mm -hmm. um, communication kind of network to start. Um, pitching the, the service. Um, we have also already, even though it's not live, um, at least with really close uh, communities um, who we n think really would eventually want to trial the service, have mentioned them whenever we've had meetings, we've been invited to conferences, so they kind of keep in the back of their mind um, this, this new service that we're tr going to be launching. Um, and just to give you kind of uh, I guess it's not a perfect uh, figure, but at least for the other service, we even though um, we don't have like a dedicated team doing um, just dissemination outreach, on average, since um, transitioning to a final version, we're seeing around 300 to 400 unique users per month. So um, we're hoping to kind of tap into that really constant um, user base and then pivot them as well to this new service because we think it will also be relevant to the main group of users that are already coming to, to our existing service. Mm -hmm. Great. Maybe Daniela wants to add something and then Yuri. Yeah, well, uh, regarding this, I really need to thank the Marketplace uh, team because, well, I've been um, <laughs> Uh, having quite some meetings with them lately, uh, precisely for this reason. So to have a place where the tool is uh, up and running, where people can test, and also connected to the data set, um, and also to a video um, which we did uh, together with the training um, team from SHOP. So um, yes, it's true that our tool is quite specific, so it so we thought about it first only as something that we would use within the wage indicator system, 
but um, over time we thought, well, why not having something that everybody can use? So if you have a text, uh, you are maybe a trade unionist or um, a researcher on collective bargaining. So you can just upload your text and have this, uh, this information, uh, information ready. So I think the marketplace is a great uh, place to um, advertise and, and make the tool uh, available. It's uh, good to hear and indeed probably even if a tool is very specific, the fact of uh, having it out there in a, such a platform may uh, find its niche, niche so to say. Uh, yes, mean. true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yes. um, maybe uh, can someone uh, give a mic? Hi, Francisca de Jong, Claire and Eric. Um, uh, as we heard this morning in the, in the opening session from uh, the project officer uh, for, for shock, uh, in the commission there is a, a deep wish for research infrastructures to not just be serving research communities but also policy makers, um, certain uh, professionals working on societal issues, etc. All your talks seem to suggest that what, you're, what, you, what you have delivered in shock could also be used outside research domain. How would you think we should advocate that or make known to wider mm -hmm. to the wider communities? Do, do you think you can do that yourself, or is there a role for shock? How do you? What do you like to see happen? Yeah. So. Obviously, I can share my, my view on that. So um, we are um, user creators. No, sorry, tools creator now. We are also user of the tools, uh, and uh, but we also doing uh, you know we are researchers. So we, we we have multiple hats on our on our heads. So heading also the the head the head to go to the um, too far away from our uh, you know domain like uh, our community and start to. Advertising this tool to the to a bigger community like the the policymaker, maybe it would be too much for our resources. So definitely some help from Shock would be great. Uh, and uh, what I'm thinking is also the tool itself should should speak for itself. So the tool should the, the quality of the tool, the usability of the tool should be uh, the best advertisement for uh, for the tool itself. And. Uh, That's for this we have the marketplace, no? That's the first. Uh, that's, yeah. that's the first step for okay, us. But when do they know that they should go there for these kind of things? True. So, uh, from uh, there was also also wanted to answer the, the second question. Yeah. So, the the, the uh, um, uh, my my approach or one of the approach we can we can suggest that uh, we go like in a two stage uh, two two stage two stage process. So first we can uh, address uh, our you know other infrastructure colleagues in uh, other infrastructures. Because each of them, uh, they have a community behind them. So, for example, for, tra for translation, so if I go to my corresponding person in another infrastructure, they have uh, 30 teams of uh, translators behind them. So, you see, in this way, we can, uh, I can just approach one and I get 30. And similar, I can do for other, you know, partners or uh, um, pr practitioners in the field. I can say also this uh, translation provider, a translation service provider, like uh, there are some company or the survey company we have in the, in Europe. So we can approach them, and then uh, it can be a simple pro 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 propagation of the of the knowledge of the, of the existence of this uh, of this tool. That would be our approach. To go, let's say, so and here we are same level. Let's say we are between peers. To go, let's say one step uh, up, like policy makers. Then maybe we need uh, uh, we need uh, uh, some help. I would say um, also in uh, making uh, you know uh, uh, so this tool not only uh, aware, so salient for them, but also they should have time to to listen to us, to to to, to take. Uh, we are not very good in catching their time. They would say that from my point of view. Um, I can also um, add a little bit to that. Um, so our service 
has actually been created by a group of very heterogeneous users. So actually, as part of our community, we do have people who work in the policy space, who work for NGOs or other civil society organizations, and they've always been embedded in our process for developing these service. Um, and we're very fortunate to have had these individuals part of our kind of work processes because they actually are very familiar with the work that we're doing, and then they allow us to actually, well, they serve more or less like a gateway to actually um, tapping in and communicating what we're doing with kind of their types of contacts. Um, and for the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry, actually we did r various rounds of testing with different types of target users. So we invited people from um, EU agencies like the Fundamental Rights Agency, DG Home. Um, we also targeted very specific migration-oriented think tanks um, like MPI Europe, um, Migration Policy Group. Um, so really cast a wide net and really invited them to, to vet the tool or the service that we were developing and let us know whether it worked for them. Um, and so because we also have this relationship already established and it worked really well for developing the initial tool, we are already thinking of doing um, a smaller version of that for the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank because we completely agree it's not a very useful service if it only serves a very small group of people. Um, and also it is our job to connect with the actual end users um, because we are also experts in the field so we have a better sense of who would actually benefit from the service that we're developing. Uh, if I may, for, um, for the tool that, that we made, I think um, shock and the marketplace are probably better to address um, in addressing researchers, while really the, um, the, the domain is more of a, of a wage indicator domain, I think, in terms of topics. So um, the wage indicator community includes uh, trade unionists, employers, uh, workers. So it's probably easier um, for wage indicator to, to reach that type of, um, of audience. And we'll definitely pick up the, um, what Ami just said. I think uh, that strategy of doing testing with different uh, groups of people, uh, we, might, uh, we might do that as well um, with, the, with our tool. Microphone, yeah. Uh, so, uh, in fact, probably uh, there is a, in, in the future of the SSH open, cloud, open cluster, uh, there may be also uh, tar uh, coordinated activities to uh, help uh, disseminate similar tools uh, uh, to uh, specific types of audiences, also by developing the kind of language that uh, you need to, as you said, um, to have to to speak to such uh, uh, potential users. Uh, are there any questions uh, from the room or from the virtual room? Otherwise, we may. Um, yeah, I think that some of the following questions have been already partially answered, but uh, I think that uh, you probably want to be able to say something on long-term uh, support. Uh, uh, for uh, your tools and resources. Start, so at least within the context of the SHOCK project, the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank isn't something that we're going to fully develop. Um, what we were just trying to do is test rigorously if such a service could be developed. So there is for us at least this very important question of, okay, we've developed a very clear way of how you would develop such a service, um, but we need to find ways to finance that type of work. Um, so that's kind of, unfortunately, I don't have an answer as to how this work will be sustained, but we are at least documenting the work that we're doing um, so that it can be preserved and accessed by anyone who might eventually be interested in picking up uh, from where we left off and building on it. Yeah, indeed, also, this is also true probably uh, in my case, in our case, uh, uh, for the terminologies. On the one hand, we want to maintain 
and support the existing resources uh, that we created, but at the same time, uh, it is important also to support and maintain uh, uh, more like the workflow that uh, that was created, because for instance, uh, uh, in our case, new uh, translation uh, services might arise that work better than the one we are recommending now, uh, and, and, and similar uh, evolutions uh, could take place. So there is a, sp and because uh, the shock marketplace is not just for tools, but also for uh, training resources, workflows, uh, I guess there is work in that direction. Yeah, in our case, it's also a demand-driven process. So as long as we need to, um, using these tools to get efficiency gains in our processes, mm -hmm. uh, we're still uh, uh, improving, developing, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, maintaining, of course. So um, unless we don't change our uh, way of working, so we don't translate a questionnaire in multiple languages, but we use, uh, I don't know, pictures or another uh, unique language for all the world, uh, the need is still there, and so we still need to the, keep working and developing this and maintain, of course, for the, for the users. So once it's for us, it's for all. Yeah, in our case, yeah, there's also a space for improvement. So I think we will keep on uh, improving the tool within the, the wage indicator um, team. Um, I really hope the marketplace will stay. Uh, because I think it's a great place to um, also keep uh, data sets updated. So it's very clear which version it is and when there is an update, researchers can see that it's there um, and there are connections, as, as Francesca was saying. So I think um, for us, that is the, that is the most important thing um, for the future. I think that there is a question from the, but maybe you wanted to say something. Okay, so well, let's take the question. Yes, hello, uh, Jana from the Wage Indicator. Uh, I had a question uh, regarding also the improvement of the tool and what, um, what role you see for end users. So for example, could end users like somebody who just did an ethnic uh, ethnic and or migration survey in, um, let's say, Colombia, can they input some data from their own survey in your tool so they can help improve? Or if I have a collective agreement uh, from Zambia, can I contribute that? So I was wondering if you see a role for these kind of end users in the improvement of the tool towards the future. Mm -hmm. Yep, so that's a really good question. So for the Ethnic and Market Minority Survey Registry, we are always accepting input from the end users. And in fact, this new round of updates that we're doing have been informed by different users who have reached out to us, let us know what they thought would be really nice to have. And then looking at the budget constraints that we had, determine whether or not it would be feasible to implement. So even for things like specific functionalities, if it can work within the, the overall structure that's been designed, we've been trying as much as we can to respond to those needs because we really want our end users to feel like it's a tool for them and they have this power to, to make the tool something that they can build into their own respective workflows. Um, I will also mention that for the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry, we did the initial kind of work of inputting all of the information that you see there. And actually, I didn't mention this before, but we're only working with metadata about surveys, so basically information about the surveys of interest to us. Um, and while we did a pretty comprehensive search and compilation, um, we now have built a feature where data producers who have produced their own new surveys, um, or even data producers who we just could not detect despite kind of searching for their surveys, um, can actually propose metadata for their own survey to be added. And that's actually something that um, we are working with. Um, I think I see Judith from GGP. We actually trialed a process like that with her and our colleagues. Um, we found a research assistant who use this online form to actually contribute metadata for GGP, which is unfortunately a survey that we weren't able to cover with um, our kind of team. Um, and then what that then, I guess, means, um, even if the ethnic and migrant minority question data bank itself is actually not designed 
to allow external users to contribute um, their own kind of um, information. We're always using the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry as a reference po point. So if in the future we have enough human resources where we have a dedicated team that's constantly kind of inputting the original questionnaires into the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Question Data Bank, presumably new surveys that are added to the Ethnic and Migrant Minority Survey Registry would be on their radar and they would include that as part of their inputting uh, workflow. Yeah, so regarding the collective agreements, well, um, as to the wage indicator system part, um, we have our coders, so we, and these are people who are in the know about the system, they have to be trained, so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a work we sort of do internally, but uh, for the tool, uh, yes, so now that the tool is out there, we really expect um, people to start using it. We might even think, as I was saying, to have some um, groups of, I don't know, trade unionists or employers uh, that we know and ask them to yeah, test it or, or use it with their own collective agreements. And then we hope to get um, feedback from them. Um, we haven't really planned this yet, but I think it's a great idea to, to improve the tool, definitely. Just, just a final remark, I want to also join Daniela in uh, thanking the um, shock marketplace, but also all, all the other players in shock that uh, help us uh, to develop our tools, uh, starting from the work package leaders. So in my case, it was work package uh, for Diana, I think it was work package for Diana, and also all the people that are helping us in the disseminating and developing uh, the IOSC when they pr organized the hub, uh, the conference in 2020. And uh, yeah, all the, yeah, just a way to um, to thank them for the for the effort and uh, their support. Yeah, it's a joint project at the end. It's not only us, but uh, it's a it's a co common uh, common effort. Yeah, indeed, indeed it is. And I think that there is also room for future coordinated, as I said, coordinated actions, uh, maybe joint training activities, uh, and uh, yeah, maybe we can move uh, to the. I don't know. Uh, I think that. We've had, we've covered a little bit the recommendations. Uh, I don't know if any one of you wants to add something, otherwise we can move to the last uh, question. So one final comment on how uh, actually uh, shock has helped, but also how can further, so the, the SSH uh, open cluster can further help, uh, um, help, help you. Um, so I, I can start. Um, so for us, I think the really, helpful thing about being part of shock is the access to resources that we didn't need that we or we didn't know that we needed um, but also might have had a harder time um, obtaining so even if we are very knowledgeable about the surveys that we are interested in um, we collectively um, did not have a strong enough background to actually know what it takes to build the types of services that we have envisioned. So through Shock, we were actually able to meet folks from infrastructures, um, people who are really um, experts about metadata and the specific protocols that we should be using. And it ensured that our service would be sustainable and was really built smartly um, in a lot of different dimensions. And then also, as I mentioned, we're a very lean team. So even if we, we understand the importance of things like dissemination, us alone doing that is quite um, intensive. So we're very lucky that we had partners in the various pa work packages, work package two, work package six, who we could partner with, tap into their expertise of being trained producing like really smart and um, targeted content um, so that we could reach as many users as we as we could within the lifespan of shock. Daniela or Yuri, one more comment? Uh, maybe yes, so yeah, in the in the past three years, I really tried to attend every, everything uh, that was organized by shock. And because we had to, so uh, we didn't have a clear idea on how to develop the tool uh, in the beginning. So it was really a work that, that changed even uh, direction sometimes over time. Uh, and it was really thanks to this event that we could uh, get uh, feedback and advice from other groups like Clarine Poland, for example, uh, helped us um, and gave us great advice. Um, so, yeah, I think the events were really important for us. Um, and well, of course, I already mentioned it. There's the hackathon, uh, which was, I think, a great experience. Um, I mean, tough, but great. 
uh, and and that also brought quite some um, some interesting um, developments to to our tool, as you could uh, as you could see. One more word. Okay, so I would say that uh, as we are approaching uh, the end of our session, um, I think that it was a yeah, very interesting discussion. I don't know if there is one last uh, question from the room or from the chat. Um, yeah, otherwise uh, I would say that uh, we can indeed uh, conclude uh, our session. I think that uh, um, the Kind of pro kinds of projects that were presented today, uh, indeed, as a language technologist, uh, so to say, show also the potential of collaboration within uh, um, SS different SSH domains, because as uh, it has been pointed out, uh, there were specific uh, competencies and uh, know-how that uh, has been uh, has been transferred or was able to circulate within the shock consortium and that made uh, such uh, projects uh, possible now uh, the, the big big challenge will be to find a way to maintain this this type of uh, uh, collaboration this type of interaction uh, maybe uh, throughout uh, uh, the new the, the cluster that will continue to exist but also maybe in a new other projects. I, for one, think that uh, uh, the work on uh, um, these types of specialized semi-structured texts, uh, questionnaire surveys, uh, uh, legal texts, uh, metadata, uh, so that they can be analyzed even in a multilingual setting is a challenge that we will <laughs> come back to. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe this can be the basis of also new projects, new collaborations, and also, as you also said, uh, the, ne the necessity to be able to uh, convey these uh, innovations to various types of users, uh, to collaborate, uh, to you know, find good ways to present them maybe, and also to train uh, new uh, typologies of, of, uh, of users of different uh, backgrounds. So thank you very much uh, to all of you who participated uh, in the room and, uh, and online. And uh, yeah, I remind you of the shock and tell challenge, which uh, is ongoing, I believe. And uh, this is the end of our session. Thank you very much.